thank you so much everybody for for us for for your attendance to this presentation thank you so much for this to this modeling group for inviting me to this uh, uh for this nice opportunity to share it with you uh, some of my research interests and my research results uh my intention of this um of this space is just to share just some of the experiences that we have uh, be, being um, um that we have been um, achieving uh, throughout different uh, collaborations and, and academic ex exercises that we have tried also to to join with the practice uh, regarding a particular aspect that is the hydrology and the stormwater quality uh, in green infrastructure. So basically, just to get into okay. So first of all, I would like to thank you to all these people, all these all these research groups that are. Uh, in which I have been involved throughout some years. Um, and all my thanks to the group Meli Melo and Gray for providing many of the nice animations that I will show in this presentation. And to colleagues from uh, Swedish universities, Colombian universities, Norwegian, and so on. Uh, and of course, the Inside the Language, where I developed some of these uh, results. And of course, the ASIA and the Tech Lab of Four for welcoming me in, in, in your team. So I will start with a simple question. What's the relationship of the cities with the hydrological cycle? If I guess that for many people, what will pop out in, in our heads is something like this, in which we have rainfall that is falling in the city nicely uh, in a smooth way. And water is conducted through channels, rivers, and so on afterwards treated in in, an, in a stormwater treatment plant or a wastewater treatment plant and then re released to the water to the water bodies in a very well structured and organized way. Okay, so that's mainly the, the idea that one could have about this. How does this indeed look in reality? Well, instead of that, it might look something like this, where we have a lot of problems in the relationship of stormwater with the cities. We have floodings, uh, important degradation of water quality in the receiving water bodies, garbage all around, even the infrastructure that is collapsing. So we will have holes like this. This is a reality. That is what is happening in the main uh, urban centers. So that's like the place in which urban hydrology born gets born. Like, well, how can we can provide a solution to all these problematics? Okay, so the first question to try to understand these issues is to, to ask ourselves, why is this happening? Where this problem comes from? Basically, it's a consequence of the impact of the urbanization process over the hydrological cycle, which means that when we have uh, a green zone such as this one, we will have two main processes that are that are that are that are helping store water to not to to be uh, delivered in an uncontrolled way. That is the evapotranspiration and the infiltration. So actually, this is like an this is these are two natural processes that are part of urban catchments and are, and sorry are part of natural zones. So once we install an, a city such as this one, we will impede the infiltration process and we will dramatically reduce as well the evapotranspiration processes will which have a consequence in the runoff of the of or of storm water increasing the runoff volumes so problems are getting bigger what we're doing basically is just setting our city as with a small casserole with a big casserole underneath taking a look to the to this picture, when we have a rainfall event, what is happening is that we are conducting through sewer pipes, all a whole complex network that is underground that will conduct this storm water to a certain point, actually, it's just converging to a point with a very important amount of pollution. That is also a key point of this, of this problematic. This pollution is a product of different things such as vehicles, high industries, human activities, and so on. So what we will have is something like this. 
where we have an important release amount of pollutants to the receiving water bodies that can be basins, wastewater treatment plants, urban rivers, and so on. The first news is that these problems, of course, are not new. I'm not the first one who identified them, of course. <laughs> this has been uh, something in which we have been thinking about for a long time, and we have been facing for a long time. For example, I would like to introduce this little picture in the 19th century of Paris, where there was a job that was called Le Traverseau des Rues. That was a, somebody who helped the woman to cross the street when it was flooded. So this is something that is happening since a long time ago. And this is another nice illustration of how people saw the city was going to be in the, in the years 2000 from the 19th century, full of pipes everywhere. So our, our conception of the problem was very, very pipe oriented. We thought about like end pipe solutions, just bring all stormwater to a certain point, get it out of the city as soon as possible, and then we will see. It's not our problem anymore. What we want to do nowadays, and we are changing of paradigm, is to think the city is more like this way, in which stormwater is controlled, regulated, and treated in the point from the point from the point in which it it, it touches the ground. Then we start doing something. And this is like the initiative of the green source control techniques or the green infrastructure. This is like the main principle of the green infrastructure in urban cities. So going back to the picture of the little sink or the big sink, releasing the stormwater, we want to go to something like this, a sponge city where water is intercepted, stored, infiltrated, and released to the atmosphere by, uh, by evapotranspiration. Okay, sounds very nice in, in theory. It's a really nice idea. But at the end, the first question that we, one should ask is, how can we do this? It's a question, a very big question, because it depends on many, many things, as we are going to see here. So the first step might be to implement green infrastructure at a local scale, of course. Green roofs infiltration and retention basins at different, point, at different parts of the city and where we can do it. Green infrastructure can be of very different types. There, are, uh, there is a very big variety of possibilities, including, for example, green roofs, permeable surfaces, retention and infiltration structures that we can place at different parts of the city. Um, and so on. So putting this into, into the big picture, into a decision frame, how, is, how does it work? The decision of whether I should put green infrastructure or where to place it, and what kind of green infrastructure is more convenient, of course, depends on, very, on, on a lot of aspects, but for this, for, for, for at least for the focus of my research, I will, I will focus it to water quality and quantity aspects that should, be nor that should be nourished by two fundamental key points, monitoring and modeling for having an appropriate decision frame. So what do I mean by monitoring and modeling? What is that? In this context, when we talk about monitoring, is of course data. What type of data should we use to, to nourish this type of decisions? Well, the first type of data that we always have is the meteorological data that is known for barely everybody of us. That when you took a look to your phone and you want to see the, 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 weather, the, the, weather, the weather prediction to see if you go outside with an umbrella or not. So this kind of data, the rainfall, and also the evapotranspiration data, and different types of meteorological variables that have an influence over the behavior, the hydrological behavior of these type of systems. But as another type of data is required to have a proper evaluation of this type of infrastructure is the output. Because of course, a, a raw, uh, for example, a garden such as this one or a roof or whatever it is at a certain point will get 
saturated of water. So we will start releasing still stone water. I need to know things about this water to take proper decisions about what, where I need to conduct it, if I am able to release it directly to the sewer system, or I need a secondary structure, and so on. And this information, of course, is way more scarce than the first case. Two fundamental variables are of interest for this point. The flow rate or hydraulic variables or pollutant related variables. So, and what we mean by modeling is to do an abstraction of this physical reality. We have a roof and we apply our, what we like as engineers, our conservation laws and so on. And we propose a set of equations, algorithm, whatever you want to call it, to represent the essential properties of this physical uh, structure that I want to, that I want to, that I want to understand. So, the modeling proposal is basically to use this meteorological data and by means of this abstraction to obtain a simulation about how this structure will behave in the, re in the regarding a certain input of data. And of course, as this is an abstraction, there is, al there is always going to be a difference between what I simulate and what I observe. By, by measuring. And that's, that is what is called model validation. This should be at least similar to validate to a certain extent that the hypotheses that I did here are compatible with the system that I am studying. So monitoring is very useful it's per se. It's an objective and can be very useful for many things besides verifying real, the reliability of models. It can be still used for controls and operations and is pretty much the strategy that is used nowadays in wastewater treatment plants, for example. But modeling is also used to provide continuous simulations of what is going to happen. These kind of questions of what if are modeling is a very natural approach to answer these type of questions. So it can be useful for design, planning, and evaluation of scenarios to incorporate these two elements into a decision frame. So I will present some examples about some applications that uh, we have been developing for hydrological, for this case, hydrological modeling and monitoring in green infrastructure. The first, um, the first experience that I want to share with you is the development of uh, software Orbis. It's a free so software that I have been developing with colleagues from INSA, um, from INSA Lyon in France and from you know, some other French private companies. We, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a software to simulate the hydrological behavior of green infrastructure by means of a very simplified approach. That is like the main the corner storm of, of, this, uh, of this implementation. So I will just present very rapidly the, 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 the software. It's free distribution. You can just download it on the internet and you know, on the link that I, that was provided in the presentation of this uh, of this launch. So here you have a picture of the of the of the software. You can choose between among different characteristics the meteorological data. So you have different type of functions to to introduce a given uh, a given time series from from meteorological data. For example, uh, oh, so sorry, it's a little bit delayed with the with the presentation, it got stuck. <laughs> ah, it's running. <laughs> okay, here I introduce um, a green roof, for example, with a given surface. Then I accept. This is just moving. <laughs> then I, I introduce a second structure that is, for example, a permeable surface with a given surface as well. And I can connect, for example, a green roof to a permeable surface to simulate what is going to happen with, uh, in regard uh, of a given climate uh, condition that I am introducing to the, to, the, to, the, to the case study. I do some simulations. I run the simulation and then I will obtain these kind of results. Where 
I can check out different properties about the, 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 the simulation, like for example, the, the quantity of a storm water. Something happened. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Something happened. Maybe the click share is too hard. Please, something happened. Okay. <laughs> okay, so you can take a look to, for example, the, the amount of water that is in this project is going to be evaporated, is going to be infiltrated, and the total of amount of rainfall that uh, is intercepted by a given area. Uh, you can check out these kind of properties as well. But, uh, okay. Wait a second. So the first, okay, so this, the, the first setting that in which we try to, to test these, um, these uh, simulation software is, uh, was for a study in which we tried to, to verify the performance of this model for real green roofs. So two, we started two green roofs that in which we had a very important amount of information. One was in Lyon in France and the other one is in Emilia, Sweden. Each of these roofs has, a, has certain particularities regarding its geometry, uh, the substrate characteristics and so on. So we had a full, um, a full uh, amount of data for each case regarding rainfall, evapotranspiration, but also we measure the flow rate at the output of the roofs. So uh, we compared to so Orbis, the, simu the simulation tool that we are proposing with different, with other different um, models that are common, commonly used in this context. These are like the two, the two roofs that, were, that we started. The first one was for Lyon in France. It's a regular green roof, very, very large roofs, about 700 square meters, which is just a singular substrate. And you have a drain underneath that is, uh, that is uh, releasing the storm water. And for the second one, we had a much more complex configuration where um, with, uh, with a roof of, with different slopes and so on. So we tried to model these two roofs with Orbis, the, the software that we are proposing, and the three other commonly used uh, models in an increasing degree of complexity. So Orbis is like the simplest case, and like she is like a physically based model where a simulation takes a really long time to be performed. So we obtained, for example, these kind of uh, simulations where we can compare the observations of the flow rate and the, the simulation provided by the, uh, by, the, by the servers. And we actually verified that all of them, they do more or less a good job. Still, we have a lot of problems to, to accurately reproduce the beginning of the event. It means that still we are not uh, reproducing 100% properly the evapotranspiration processes and the dry weather related processes, because when, Rainfall starts at the beginning. The model has is, all models are struggling to 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 catch up the the flow rate in the in the right way, but still, we did this over a lot of data to test all of these models, and we uh, verified the flexibility of the implementation of over Arvis, and we verified as well that the modeling results were acceptable, and we couldn't find any statistical evidence that any of the four models had better simulation capacities or prediction capacities than any of the others. And something that we learned from this study, and there are also many other studies that show us the same evidence, is that uncertainties in simulations should be reported. It's, they are unavoidable. Still, we will never, at this point of knowledge, we are not able to reproduce perfectly these observations and these models will have uncertainties. You can still try to, to, to propose the most possible physically based model, uh, including all physical laws of conservation in three dimensions and so on. And 
you still will not be able to perfectly match the flow rate that is going outside of the of the of the roof so uncertainties should be reported and for assessing uncertainties we need data there is no other way to to properly assess these uncertainties second application so we bring our business now not to a single roof but to a set to a whole block a, uh, of, of, of uh, to a whole block of buildings to see how we can propose an intelligent design of green infrastructure for example for this zone in france it was just a recently uh, industrial zone that was constructed and we wanted to test different green infrastructure scenarios to see how we can propose something to avoid as much as possible the the, the release of storm water from this urban zone. So we studied this case. We proposed, to, proposed basically three scenarios in which we just use traditional approach, just sewer pipes all around. And we put a, a basin at the output to, to avoid, the, to, to receive all this storm water, a big infiltration basin. The scenario two, uh, the scenario two sorry, we are going to introduce some infiltration soils inside the urban zone. Infiltration soils are basically like green channels that stock storm water and they infiltrate it. And a third scenario with including green roofs and infiltration soils in combination. And for the three of them, we put a basin at the outside to catch all the storm water. And we will see how big the basin should needed to, is needed to, how big the basin should be in order to avoid overflows in our system. So for the first scenario for a given block, for example, here in yellow, we just put a sewer pipe and so on. We do it for all the blocks. And then these this sewer pipes will conduce, conduce storm water to an infiltration basin such as this one, where we have different type of flows. Of course, the rainfall that is falling over the basin, then the infiltration, and the, the, the evaporation. What we don't want, or we need the infiltration basin to be that big that actually overflows will not occur. For the second case, we did something very similar. We, 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 we propose an infiltration basin on the output, but we introduce soils in the blocks. By using the multiple soils in which we have more or less the same time of fluxes, the rainfall falling, but also you have the flow from the soil that is uh, the, that is upstream of the of this of this one, and uh, you have infiltration and evaporation and some flow going downstream to the other soil. It's like a chain of soils, and then this chain of soil, soils will release some water to the infiltration base. What we don't want is any overflow for none of the case. So this should be considered in our design. And the third scenario is more or less the same, but included a green roof inside each of the blocks. That the green roofs will be connected mm -hmm. to the soil. So if the green roof is completely saturated, it will, it will start releasing some water to the soil. We found these results for each one of the scenarios in each of the columns. We can see that for the, for the traditional case full of pipes, we need a basin of 1,600 uh, cubic meters, which is, is a lot. And it was go, it's going to be a very costly solution. But for the two others, we see an important benefit in terms of the size of the basin that we will need at the output, just 30 square, 30 and 20 cubic meters. And for the third scenario, we reduce by the half the, the, the need of soils re replaced by the use of green roofs. So going to the third acts of this, uh, of this talk, we are going to talk about the storm water quality and pollutants. That's our business model, water, water quality. This is some, some topic that has been um, discussed before and it's a question that is, com is commonly raised. And the answer is no yet. Why? Very simple because pollutant processes are less, uh, le less understood than the hydrological ones in green infrastructure. It is a fact, and we have a lot of evidence showing this. 
So at this this state of the knowledge, we it is not pertinent to include um, polluted models in this kind of approaches. And I will show the reasons why it's more or less this way. The first thing that we need to understand about water quality is that monitoring water quality is a very complex task. And we have less, less, less experience doing this than for the case of hydrology. We have been measuring flow rate since decades, decades. But for the case of water quality, what we did in the past was just traditional sampling. That means going to the site, take some samples, go to the laboratory, perform my, my laboratory analysis, which will give me just a set of points, a set of measurements. Uh, to try to assess this water quality. But nowadays in the recent number, 20, since 20 years ago, perhaps, online motor monitoring has emerged as an uh, interesting alter alternative to water quality monitoring in which devices such as, as surveillimeters are used in order to have a measure of water quality online with a very high ter temporal resolution. For example, every minute will, that will provide us a better detail about the, the, the dynamics of the pollutants. So uh, being able to see these dynamics is the first step to have a proper model. And we have been doing this just for no more than 10 years or 20 perhaps. There are more complex measurement devices or more uh, devices that are able to measure a high, um, a more elaborate, uh, to, to provide us a more elaborate picture of the of the of the composition of the water, such as the UVVC spectrometer, that is basically the same thing as a turbidimeter, but measuring the absorbance of uh, of light at different wavelengths. That this at the end provides us a very large spectra of all the pollutants, or not all, but of many pollutants that we can find in the storm water, from organic to inorganic ones to solve to dissolve and to suspended pollutants as well, giving us a spectra such as this one in which we can still measure water quality with a very high temporal resolution, but having a more reach about the, composite, the, 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 the compounds that can be found in the, in the water matrix. This last application was a study that, I, that we performed with some students uh, for assessing water quality in green infrastructure. So, we, we did a study in a constructed well. That is something more or less that looks this way. And actually it's the, these wetlands are, are aimed to treat the storm water. Um, for this case, this wetland was treating the storm water from a parking lot, working more or less like this. During rainfall, you have storm water that is coming to the system. Then you have a tank to, to set in for us for, for, for in, taking out the, set, the, the very heavy sediments, and then pollutants will flow to the, to, the, to the constructed wetland, which is going to be filled more or less this way. And then this is like the, 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 the dynamic of the mass that is entering to the system. And during the dry wear period, you will have some fade processes apart from B from the accumulation and retention processes of pollutants in this type of structures. Mm -hmm. So this is the structure that we were starting, collecting a park, uh, somewhere from a parking lot. We instrumented the place with measurements in, at the inlet, at the outlet with UVB spectrometry to assess the, the behavior of different types of pollutants. Uh, for this case, we propose a very a physically ba based model based in uh, conservation laws. So we just completely take, went from the simple approach of orbits to a very, very robust model from, a, from the point of the detail in the physical description that we're trying to address and with measurements of a pollutant that is, or yeah, a pollutant that is uh, called chemical oxygen demand, that is basically a, a surrogate of the organic matter in the, at the output and input of the system. So we have this kind of time series during a rainfall event. And we assess the influence of initial conditions in the model to this response. 
that was like the big question that we tried to address. Sorry, the presentation is not, it's just. <laughs> so yeah, we tried to assess the initial conditions by means of three different scenarios, try to assess the, the how the pollutants are getting accumulated um, in the, inside the wetland at the beginning of the events by def by defining different zones and trying to to see how these accumulation processes are 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 happening in each of the of of, of the parts of the wetland and we obtained a very a reasonable estimation of the initial conditions where we can see that there was an accumulation at the end of the by the this is at the end of the at the last part of the of the of the outlet of the wetland, uh, which can provide the needs of information and we can provide a, a key can guide and, and at the end we can guide a, um, active maintenance activities of these uh, of this type of systems these are the simulations which are acceptable but still work needs to be done but so from this study, we can conclude that better simulations were achieved from more complex models and the heterogeneity of this pollution in the, in the system uh, is an important fact to explain the, the output actually. Mm, the proposed model setting uh, let us to identify monitoring requirements. We need to better address the distribution of these pollutants along, along the, the wetland and challenges for modeling pollutant dynamics um can let us to have more elements to assess long-term pollutant pollution emissions from urban areas and of course for having proper decisions this uncertain the uncertainties in these simulations needs to be included for the case of water quality as well so main key points from this talk first of all <coughs> measure 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 Long-term and high-resolution data remains the main cornerstone for building knowledge about these uh, aspects in green infrastructure. No perfect model of that exists, neither for water quality, neither for water quantity. So uncertainties are a must and are unavoidable and should be reported as part of the scientific practices that um, the, the scientific and engineering practices that we would like to, to assess for these cases. And water quality processes are less understood than the hydrological ones, although both remain uncertain. Models are useful. As somebody said, all of them are wrong, but some are useful. Decision making can incorporate this kind of, this type of mathematical models to extract the main elements or the main information that can provide a more informed picture towards decision making in this type of problematics. So these are just some groups that I visited, uh, pro seeing or showing the, the potential benefits of green roofs. This is just not controlling a storm water, but we can also do some harvesting. This can, they can be a recre recreational point, a gathering point, and so many, many things. Mm -hmm. I don't know why the presentation is, is slow, so let's wait a second. Rainfall is not a problem anymore or shouldn't be a problem anymore, but still, let's make it a solution. So at the end, that's a little bit the message. These structures, such as the well and the roofs and so on, could be this. We can use rainfall still of being fighting against it. That is for sure a battle that we're never going to win. So. Let's make the best of it. And city plan for the future will not be distinguishable from gardeners. This is the way we want to see our cities in many, many years. At least is like the, the vision that we want to, to transmit with these uh, researches. Thank you so much for your attention.